Let's give them some bombs here. So connective connective questions. Um, now the leads you call now, are they typically a week old, two weeks old, day old? What's your average lead? Before you get off the phone, I know you're majority training. of them have just recently requested the information. So they do they respond to a mailer or more Facebook ads, or where are they coming from? The combination of mailer, internet, and TV. Okay, so just all over the place. So what's one good connective question that we trained you? Just because there's about three or four you need to ask for your industry, but what's one example of one that you started using, and how did the prospects react to that? If they had said something like, I was just curious about the ad, right? Mm -hmm. Then then I'll one thing I didn't used to say that I would say now would be, um, okay, well, what was it about the ad that prompted you to inquire? Yeah. And did you see how she slowed down there? Instead of saying, oh, what was it about the ad that prompted you to inquire? That's too fast. It's going to go in one ear out the other with the average prospect. She slowed, oh, and what? And see her curious tone there? That's a curious tone she said that in. Oh, and what, I guess, what was it about the ad that caused you to uh, in inquire, just so I understand? See, it's like you're, it's a curious type of tone that you're using there. Now, when you started using even that basic of a question, how did your prospects start responding compared to before? Well, I mean, they would just, they would, I mean, they would just tell me, they would just give me a lot more information about where they were coming from rather than me just making all these assumptions. Yeah about what they were seeing or what they thought they were looking at. Yeah. It, so we would just have much better quality conversations. Yeah, right, when you have much better quality conversations, it builds far more trust. Yeah, trust and- where the sales made. And I'm closing so many gaps along the way because right. I understand everything. You understand the real situation. Will you tell Matt I'm gonna be five minutes behind on the podcast? Okay, now I wanna come back in. So that's just one example of one connecting question. There are a few others that you have to ask for your space that are very important. Let's jump, we don't have time to go through all that for everybody. What's an important situation question that you learn how to ask from us that really helps you? Because there's about three or four for your space that you really need to ask, sometimes more. I'm not talking about like health questions and stuff like that, but like what's one good situation question that you learn how to ask to help them find out what their real situation really was? Um, so don't be mad at me, but I don't know if this question that I'm about to give you is an actual situation question. Okay. Go for so, it. Um, the one that I like to use to kind of just get to know where they're at is, um, so before today, were you kind of out there, you know, looking for a solution to put something in place? Yeah. And then I'll ask them, you know, how long have they been looking and what have they found? And there's a whole bunch of of tree branches from there that get to I get to know so much. Yeah, that's a solution awareness question. Okay. You're just asking in the wrong place. <laughs> that's OK. Seventy four percent conversion rate is still good, but we can always get seventy eight to eighty five. Right. OK. So, <laughs> so typically situation questions might be let me pull up one of your sales structures from your space. Um, it could be like, uh, what are you doing now? Or what are you it using could be, now? Um, Okay. Well, maybe you walk me through, like, what do you, I guess, what do you have in place as far as maybe like, you know, coverage or, you know, you know, savings and investments. Okay. That are so what we say it is, um, we say, um, so what, what exactly do we say? Um, like what type of protection, if any, yeah. do you currently have in place yeah. for your family? Um, yeah. You know, if something were to happen to you. Yeah, that's good. Like, yeah, what type of uh, you know, possible, you know, policies, you know, savings, different investments mm -hmm. do you have to go towards paying for, you know, like your, your funeral and final expenses for when you do pass away or maybe walk me through something like, can you walk me through what you walk me through is called an NEPQ lead in phrase. It's a good way to start in your first situation questions. All right. Now there's other situation questions you need to ask. And here's the thing I want everybody to understand. Situation questions are not just for you, the salesperson to understand their situation. More importantly, it's for your prospect to understand their real situation. Cause I hate to tell all of you, it doesn't matter your industry in your prospects do not, for the most part, understand what their real situation is when you first start talking to them, especially in your space, the life insurance, final expense insurance. It's not like they sit around on Sundays like, all right, well, what do I have in place now? What are my expenses? Like if I pass away next week with my utility bills and this, and if I pass away in a year, like compared to 10 years, how they're not thinking that. 
No. Okay. So we can't tell them that because it goes in one ear out the other. We're the salesperson. We're biased. But what Dana is suggesting is our questions allow them to tell themselves what their real situation is. Because if we can't help them find out the real situation, it's impossible to build a gap on where they want to be if they don't even know where they're at. There's no gap there. There's no sale. Okay. There's a lot more to that. Uh, problem awareness question. What's a good problem awareness question you've learned how to ask that causes them to start to see that they have many more problems than maybe they originally thought they did? Um, well, I know that has to do with when I ask them if they like something. Not necessarily. Um, it, it could it could be a little bit different. Like typically in your space, it's more of like, so typically, and I'll give you an example here. Like, what do you find out usually? Like once you take them through situation questions and they give you a little, you know, they kind of data dump a little bit. What typically do you find out most of the time? I find out that they don't have any protection. They don't have anything in savings. They're very confused in general with how life insurance works. Mm -hmm. And um, I try to find out if there's like a backup plan, a plan B. Yeah. Um, and then I try to kind of make them question Yeah. if that's and what they really want to do. Yeah, you're putting a scene out. So one good situation question you ask for industry that leads into your first problem awareness is, okay, so after they say, no, I don't have any insurance. I don't have a policy. Maybe they say that. Okay, well, uh, maybe if I could ask in a different way, like, I guess, what do you have in place as far as maybe a, a safety net, you know, like savings, investments, you know, those type of things that would go towards, you know, paying for your funeral, um, the, you know, the, the ceremonies, the coffins, maybe a little, leave a little bit extra for your family for when you do pass away. Oh, I don't have anything. Okay, but who would be, so if you don't have anything, like who in your family or, or or people, you know, who would be responsible for having to go in, you know, meet the funeral director, um, have to plan out the ceremony, have to pay for the funeral, the, the coffin, the, the ceremony, the whatever you, you guys say, who would be the one responsible to have to pay all that? It's important to say responsible to pay for, that. oh, my daughter, she'd have to pay for all that. And then what that does is it sets up your first problem awareness question yeah. and you lean in, oh, your daughter. Um, do you, I can answer this for you. <laughs> I mean, do you, do you want her to have to pay for all of that? If you didn't have to, that sets up the first problem. No, if I didn't have to see that, that you have to do that the right tone. What were you going to say? I was just going to say exactly what you said. Okay. So you've learned. <laughs> okay. I knew, I knew that, but that kind of sets up, you have to get that, that situation question to set up that first problem awareness, because typically in your space, it's not, do you like, it's more, do you want after wow. you find out the problem? Cause usually in situation questions in your industry, a lot of times you can already find out the problem or at least one of the problems right there. I okay. find it's even more valuable though, which I, a lot of my team skips mm -hmm. uh, after they ask that question, you really have to follow it up with asking them why. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. why is different and you can't assume. Yeah. So you, so you lean in, I'll just, I'll just do this. Right. So do you, I mean, do you want her to, now I want to make sure everybody understands, watch how I do this. Cause if I say, do you want her to have to pay for all the expenses? If you didn't have to, that's completely different than if I lean in and say, so do you, I mean, do you, do you want her to have to pay for all that? If you, if you didn't have to notice, that's a concern tone. A tone that shows empathy there. Well, no, I mean, if I didn't have to. Okay, so how many, like, how would, I mean, how, what do you ask after that? Tell me the question you usually ask after that. Let's see. If I, I go right, I go right for the kill. So, so when, when they say they don't, I say a couple variations of it. But um, the first one would be, okay, but why though? Like a probing question. Or I'll say, so what's going on, you know, with your kids that would make you think that you wouldn't want them to have to pay for it or they couldn't pay for it? Like, yeah. why, why, why do you think they would struggle with that? And just kind of just, I need them to tell me more yeah. about their family situation so I can kind of hold them accountable for that at the end. So, so her not having to pay all that, why so important to you? See that tone? So yeah. her not having to pay all that. Why so important to you? See that tone? It's a concern tone. It's a tone. Your tone's really good there. And it's beautiful. It works. If you do it the right way, yeah. I mean, it works every time. 
So they open up and what do they typically say to that? They'll tell me that their kids can't afford it or that they're married with their own kids and they don't want to be a financial burden. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it just allows me to, I, I understand, yeah. you know, and, and just have so, that more deeper conversation. Yeah, what it does is it causes them to open up and go deep into the conversation and they start to relive the pain of not wanting a family member to be left with this debt, to be left with that financial burden. And as a parent, usually, right, nobody wants to leave their kids with the financial burden. No. But it's how she just asked that, that causes them to feel like they can open up to Dana. Whereas if I asked that like in a sarcastic, mean way or too fast, they would feel like I'm just selling them. The tone right. is what matters there. The question matters too, but the tone is 70% of that, 100%. Okay, solution awareness questions. What's a good solution awareness question you ask to get them to think about what their future is going to look like when it does happen? And now their family's financially protected and there's no burden and it's just smooth. Well, one of the things I like to say, you know, is put them in the in the mental in the mental state of like what like what's prevented you from doing this in the past. Yep. Yep. That's good. Um, and then having them picture like the benefits of what solving this problem will do for their kids. So we do both, right? We do the consequence question, what will happen if they don't do anything at all? And then helping them picture what that looks like if it gets resolved. So um, honestly, I do think the consequence question, the way that I've experimented with both is more powerful. Yeah, solution then into consequence because the solution awareness question gets them to see what it's gonna be like when they pass away Families protected, everything's smooth. And then you rip that away with a consequence question where, you know, what are the consequences if they don't do anything? Give us an example of a good consequence question that you've learned. I mean, I say, so have you, have you thought about what would happen if you just decided not to do anything at all? And what do they say? And well, if they say yes, um, you know, I, I might say something like, you know, does that cause you to be concerned? And, and, um, and they'll say, you know, if they say yes, no, then, then I'll just keep probing into that and say, well, um, I mean, but I know you've been thinking about this for a long time and, you know, you really haven't done anything yet. So what does it, what does it look like really for your, for your kids? If you keep going in this direction of not putting something in place and something actually does happen to you and now your kids don't have that money that you said you wanted for them so they don't have to come out of pocket and be a burden on their family. I mean, what does that really look like for them? I like that. What happens if you don't do anything about this and you end up passing away earlier than you thought and now Carrie's responsible to have to pay for everything? You need to like tone it down like a little bit like that. Just sure. tell it. Perfect. I like that. We just we just got to trim like the gingerbread. We got to trim a little, little stuff off the fluff. I like that. All right. So we're not going to go into your presentation because we don't have time, but what's a good commitment question you asked to get them to commit, to take the next step, purchase a policy and get where they want, solve their problem. Um, probably an easy one I use is um, like, do you feel like this could, could be the answer for you? That's beautiful. And, and if and they say yes, then I'd make them tell me why. <laughs> Do you feel like this could be the answer for you? That verbal pause is important in that one. That's really good. And most of the time, typically you're going to get one of two responses. Oh yeah, for sure. Or I do, but, and then it depends they on the price. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I do, but right, right. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to get one of those things. And, and typically you would ask the commitment question after you go through the presentation and bring right. up the price. You typically don't want to use that before most of the time, because what will happen if you if you say that before you bring up the options and the prices, a lot of people say, well, it just depends on the price. So then it kind of stops it. So you typically want to ask it after you bring up the presentation and the price, typically most of the time for your space. OK. All right. Any last because typically once they say, oh, I do. What do you say then? Uh, then I would if they just say, yes, I do. Then I say, well, would you mind sharing with me why you think it would help you and your family? 
Why do you feel like it would though? Yeah, it's a good probing question, right? And then they tell you what? They tell me why they want it. Yeah, right. See, self-persuasion. See, yeah. you know, it's an easy, it's an easy probing question. All right, Dana, well done. I got to jump into this podcast. Congratulations you. on your success. You got a big team now. You're even off the phone because you've sold so much. You're like yes. the legend over there making doodles and Googles. I mean, you have to live in California. I mean, if you if you're not making at least half a million a year or more, like it's hard <laughs> taxes. You know, it's definitely not cheap to live here. They take half your income over there. Um, all right. Any last words of advice you would have for maybe a new salesperson getting into sales, or maybe even a vet that was you know making low six figures, you know six figures like you were before you got in. I think it's even more important for the vets to take advantage of this because there's so many bad habits that yeah. you probably have that you need to erase and just start fresh. And you have to be open to that, right? You have to be open to learning how to do it a new way um, and to not be afraid of what the investment is because God, it paid me back in two weeks. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Done. <laughs> I, I, our clients, I mean, I don't know how many thousands of clients we have now, but I, I, that's probably the thing we hear the most is that, oh my gosh, it's ROI like instantly compared to purchasing other things that take months or years. This is like instant ROI. Sometimes it's instant ROI the next sales call, right? Or the next day. All right. Well done, Dana. Congratulations. Keep strolling. And the great thing is you're still learning. You're still advancing. You know, six months from now, you're going to be even better than you are right now. That's the goal. That's that's the cool thing about this. We are always learning. You know, as my good friend Brad says, Bradley is training something you did or is training something that you do if you want to be a top 1% earning sales person. And congratulations. That's where you're at in your Thank industry. Thank you for having me. All right. You're welcome. All right. Now, if you guys want to learn more advanced skills, we just gave you little nuggets, little nibbles there. You want to start making your first 10, 15, 20,000 per month in commissions in your industry watching us right now. You want to start making your first 30 or 40 or even 50 grand every single month. Cause I can assure you, we are already training people in your industry that are hitting those numbers every single month right now. Every industry on here, watch me right now. Okay. So you want to acquire those skills, message me directly right now. If you're on LinkedIn, the Facebook group, my Facebook, the Facebook business page messages me directly right now. If you're on YouTube, you'll have to join the Facebook group. I'll have somebody on our team post that here on our YouTube channel. Uh, I believe it's uh, salesrevolution.pro, salesrevolution.pro. And right when you join, anybody in relationship banking? Yes, we train people in banking as well. Well, actually, it's the only industry we refuse to train. We're just going to leave you guys out in the cold. I'm joking. All right. So you want to acquire those skills? Message me directly right now. We'll give you some different training options for your industry if you want to make a lot more like Dana and all these other clients. Dana, thanks so much. Enjoy that weather in California. I'll be out there in a couple of weeks. I got a keynote in Carlsbad. I love Southern California. Nice. Nice weather. <laughs> okay. Thank right. you. Thanks, everybody. Hey, we will also be going live tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern. I will do a 30-minute subject matter training. I haven't picked out what I'm going to train on, but make sure you show up in the Facebook group 6 p.m. Eastern tomorrow. I will do a 30-minute training. Um on a subject. I just haven't picked it out yet. See you tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern. Dana, thanks so much. We'll see you soon. Thanks, guys. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed these, here's another you can watch right over here, right over here. Join our free sales revolution group. Click the link below. Join us and we're going to help you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you real soon.